Okay. Um, so now we move to uh, Professor Silvia Ferrari, uh, one of the luminaries of law and religion in general and in Europe uh, especially. And uh, he gave us a little foretaste of what he is going to do yesterday he, with your he brought question. Me into this field. What? He brought me in into this field. <laughs> okay. Everybody who votes guilty votes guilty. Uh, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, uh, the provocative uh, title is to talk about liberty and equality. Please, Professor Ferrari. Yes, I think that uh, my Italian accent is not so different from the Spanish accent <laughs> of uh, Nathan, ju just a little worse. <laughs> so, so you are, uh, you are, uh, uh, let's say, you, you have to to strive to to understand me, but I hope you succeed. So, um, my starting point is a statement by an American lawyer, a friend of mine, Fred Gedix. Uh, and according to him, I quote, uh, the liberal democracies of the West have shifted their principal orientation from liberty to equality. And Gedix says that this shift is due to the fact that the complexity of the religious landscape of the contemporary welfare state requires the adoption of a general norm of equality, both among religions and between belief and unbelief. So Gedix's position is a uh, quite a clear cut, uh, to govern uh, religious and cultural diversity, we need more equal treatment. My following step is connecting Gedic's remarks to uh, the influential books written by Winifred Sullivan, The Impossibility of Religious Freedom, and Brian later, uh, why tolerate uh, religion? In, uh, in different ways, uh, these two authors argue that uh, the right to religious freedom is not uh, an uh, helpful uh, legal tool to manage uh, religious diversity in contemporary societies. And uh, they suggest that uh, a step towards a more equal treatment uh, is required, even if this can imply some limitations on um, religious freedom. In my view, and this is my third point, uh, this shift from liberty to uh, equality can be seen as a part of a broader shift from substantive to functional rights. And uh, now I would like to um, try to explain what I mean uh, by passage shift from substantive to functional rights. Uh, let us take the right to freedom of religion. Uh, the right to freedom of religion depends uh, quite heavily on uh, the notion of religion we adopt. And uh, as uh, there is no universally recognized and shared notion of uh, religion, the effectiveness of this right is uh, strongly limited. This is uh, the point made by Sullivan, basically. Therefore, this is the consequence, it is advisable to disconnect the protection of freedom of religion from a right that is grounded on a controversial notion, religion, and rely instead on a set of rights that are, one, content-free, and two, functionally oriented. Uh, Non-discrimination and uh, equal treatment are empty rights, Rex uh, told us uh, so yesterday, in the sense, and this is my interpretation, that they 
do not have a specific content. They can be employed to protect religious beliefs, political convictions, sexual orientations, ethnic affiliation, and so on. So the value of these rights, non-discrimination and equal treatment, lies in the function they perform, not in the content they protect. And therefore, these rights are much less connected to a specific culture, history, land, than freedom of religion. And for this reason, they are more suitable to be employed on a global scale, granting uh, the deterritorialization of legal categories that is required by the globalization of law. Now, at this point, uh, the question uh, I would like to pose is, what is likely to be gained and what is likely to be lost in this shift from uh, freedom to uh, equality? And uh, in my opinion, there is uh, no general answer, as the impact and the outcome of the shift depends on the context in which the shift takes uh, place. And let me uh, give you, uh, let me explain this point uh, by making reference to the uh, legal systems of the European countries and uh, um, uh, by employing uh, traditional distinctions between uh, individual and collective rights on the one hand and uh, negative and positive freedoms on the other hand. Starting from individual and negative rights, uh, today in uh, virtually all European countries, Catholics, uh, Protestants, <coughs> Orthodox, uh, atheists, uh, uh, members of minority religions, uh, apostates, uh, are not subjected to any limitation of their civil and political rights depending on the convictions they have or the religion they profess. Uh, nowhere in Europe um, uh, we have systems of personal laws that differentiate the right uh, to perform a marriage, to get a divorce, um, to uh, inherit, for example, um, according to the religion professed by an individual. Uh, there are some exceptions, but they are quite um, limited. Uh, moving to uh, individual and positive rights, uh, the picture is uh, slightly uh, different. Uh, generally speaking, everybody in Europe has uh, the right to profess and practice his or her religious or non-religious beliefs. There are no laws preventing conversion, um, uh, no laws regarding apostasy, no laws regarding proselytism except in Greece. And the freedom of expression in religious matters is largely protected. Uh, however, the number of exceptions to this general rule is higher than in the case of negative rights. And uh, everybody has in mind the French prohibition to wear religious symbols at the school, or the fact that in Belgium, um, a Seventh-day Adventist student um, has to attend um, school uh, on Saturday, which is uh, forbidden by his or her religion, etc., etc. However, I think that uh, it can be affirmed that uh, the core of uh, the individual right to profess and practice religious and non-religious <coughs> beliefs 
is uh, better protected uh, in the European countries that, uh, than in many countries that surround Europe. And uh, my first uh, provisional conclusion is uh, the following. The goal uh, to grant religious freedom through religious equality is uh, largely attained in the field of individual rights. Uh, religious equality is instrumental in this area to grant religious freedom of all individuals. In the area of uh, collective rights, on the contrary, equality and non-discrimination do not play a comparable role in Europe. Uh, I shall consider uh, first uh, the negative uh, profile of uh, these rights, uh, that is uh, the freedom from state interference uh, in uh, the definition of the rules uh, governing uh, the relations among the members of an association and uh, its internal organization, what we call associational autonomy. In this area, the general principle is that religious organizations have the right to determine autonomously their tenets and their internal structure. And this autonomy can be extended to faith-based companies like a hospital or a school run by a religious community. Uh, from this point of view, in my opinion, uh, there is a quite a significant uh, divide between uh, religious and uh, non-religious organizations, in the sense uh, that uh, religious organizations are granted uh, wider and stronger powers of uh, self-administration than non-religious organizations. Uh, the first uh, um, enjoying uh, frequently the right to be exempted from the respect of equality and non-discrimination rules that, on the contrary, must be observed by non-religious organizations. Um, in, in, in other words, the non-discrimination rules that apply uh, to most secular organization, including political parties, including trade unions, so organizations that have an ideological bias, these rules do not apply to religious organization, or at least do not apply with the same strength. Now, in recent years, uh, this system of exemption from equality and non-discrimination rules in favor of religious organization has become controversial, and a more extensive application of the principle of equality and non-discrimination to the activity and internal structure of religious organization has been invoked, and there are many examples of this. Uh, this is likely to shorten uh, the distance with non-religious organization. However, my assessment is uh, that we are still far from a situation where religious and non-religious organizations are subjected to the same non-discrimination rules. Uh, this conclusion is uh, confirmed by an exam of the positive side of the collective rights of freedom of religion and belief. And here, in the area of um, collective and positive rights, the main issue is the support granted by the state on the one hand to religious and non-religious organization, and on the other hand to majority and minority religious organizations. Uh, most European states are very selective in uh, distributing their support and tend to privilege heavily uh, majority religions 
of both minority religions and non-religious groups. Uh, it's uh, enough uh, to look at uh, the legal provisions that are in force in uh, Europe concerning uh, the registration of religious communities, uh, the financial <coughs> contribution uh, they receive from the state, the teaching of religion in state schools, and you can clearly see this selective distribution of state support. And such selectivity frequently has the consequence that a different treatment of minority religion and belief groups have a negative impact on their religious freedom itself. So, concluding this part, uh, in my opinion, an exam of the European legal system shows that the principle of equality and non-discrimination have been more effective concerning individual than collective rights. In this last field, in this last field of law, the goal to grant freedom of religion through religious equality has been much less successful. Uh, there is another part of my uh, paper where I um, discuss uh, the different national contexts in which uh, the different shift, the shift from uh, liberty to uh, equality has uh, taken place and the influence that the different national contexts are on this shift. But uh, there is uh, no time to uh, uh, deal with this part, so I shall come to my uh, conclusion. Three points. First, I think there is a shift from liberty to equality in Western democracy. Gedix is right, in my opinion. But uh, the forms and outcome of this shift are different in different legal systems and in different fields of law. So we should uh, have a much more <coughs> articulated and case-by-case -case evaluation of the process. Second, uh, the most problematic uh, feature, to my eyes, of this shift is its negative impact on the internal autonomy of religious organizations. And this because uh, this shift can affect reducing the internal autonomy of a religious organization can affect the social pluralism that is uh, an indispensable component of democracy. Um, on the contrary, this shift has had beneficial <coughs> effects on um, the enjoyment of individual uh, rights of religious freedom. Uh, final uh, conclusion, uh, depending on this uh, second point, I think uh, that only a just combination of liberty and equality can grant an uh, um, ordered uh, progress of society. We cannot replace uh, uh, liberty with equality. We cannot uh, give uh, room only to religious liberty. We need to find a balance uh, between the two. I understand that this is a quite banal conclusion, <laughs> but I think that is also a wise uh, one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. yes. Rex. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Farabi. Uh, if you'd be one of my professors, I'd I'll give you a higher rating because it's very lucid, very clean, and very systematic. Thank you for that. Um, there's a lot to comment, but well, one thing I, this brings out this clash again, where I was, is the, uh, 
is the religious group autonomy or the association of autonomy referred to of religious organisations. Because as you know, one of the constant pressure points is um, persons who belong to churches and other religious bodies who seek to bring legal actions against them for because they discriminate against the member of the church on the basis of sex or sexual orientation. And so on. Now, um, I'm, I'm a very strong defender of church or religious group autonomy. So in, in that clash, I would always come down on the side of, of the religious body to be, if you like, as nasty and as bigoted from, from a liberal point of view as they want to be. Because the traditional answer is, of course, that if the person doesn't like this organisation, they can leave. Now, the right of exit can be, of course, rather more difficult than this may be, but in principle, um, if they don't like it, they can buzz off and uh, form another organisation or church that's more congenial to them, as Protestants always do, of course. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Presbyterians in particular. But, um, but um, I don't want my point, uh, so, so getting back to my point, I'm starting to ramble here. Um, I, I just wonder what, what your comment would be. Now, you'd said at one point that religious bodies or organisations tend to be treated more favourably in greater latitude than non-religious or secular. In Europe. In, in Europe. Europe. Okay, in Europe. well, that might, I think that's probably true else. Um, I, I, I just wonder, now, now, now straight away to the uh, quality gurus amongst the aficionados, they are starting to feel a bit nervous and you know, their, their antennae are coming up and they're saying, well, there, there's something quite you know, unequal about this. Mm -hmm. well, you know my response to that is, I'm not worried about that, but I mean, that's, um, but why, I mean, is, well, perhaps I'll put it, that, that can be my question. Is that a problem that religious organisations or bodies appear to have greater latitude to quite discriminate than do non-religious? Is that a problem? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, what I have in mind is, uh, for example, um, in many European countries, uh, uh, a teacher of religion or a teacher in a religiously oriented school can be fired um, if in his or her private life does not uh, comply with uh, uh, the tenets of that religion. Uh, I do not find uh, uh, a comparable, uh, um, uh, a comparable uh, uh, requirement if I think of non-religious organizations, of a political party or uh, a trade union. There, the, the distinction between private life and professional life uh, is much more clear-cut. Uh, when, when we speak of religion, for understandable reasons, this uh, distinction is um, much less uh, uh, clear, much less definite. That is why I uh, claim that the um, autonomy of religious organization is stronger in many European countries than the autonomy of non-religious organization like political parties or trade unions. I'm not against this. It's just a description. But in my opinion, this is today's situation. Um, maybe pushing uh, two points, one pushing uh, further on what Rex was just saying. Um, so the political association is, is contrasted to the religious association, but it, does it depend on what level of comparison we take? So political organization can exclude people on the basis of their political opinions. A religious organization, the person who is excluded on the basis of, say, sexual orientation, is still, it's part of the religious ethos of that organization. There's a, there's a curiosity, I think, in um, discrimination law that religion is often defined down to uh, a notion of belief in um, doctrinal content as opposed to trying to create an ethic of life, for example. Um, I was going to ask as well about uh, the functionalization of rights. And uh, I, I think um, 
it's, this argument is identified as, as common now, and I wonder what people say to, for example, um, speech or types of, uh, or as, as within a particular right, whether there is a hierarchy. So in Europe, for example, uh, political speech is more important than commercial speech. Um, and at what place would religious speech fit within that? Is a is an internal contest that potentially just replicates some of the questions already being discussed. You could do that in association as well. And the other, other point I was thinking is that typically people who want to functionalize rights, they want to maintain, so they want to eliminate the specialness or distinctiveness of religion, but maintain it for the purposes of non-establishment or forum internum arguments. Hmm. The state is somehow disabled in some sense, so Ice River and Sega equal regard, get rid of distinctiveness of religion, mm -hmm. but keep non-establishment. We don't want any signs saying Christian community or anything, because that's that's terrible, as opposed to nuclear-free community, as their example says. Um, so I, I wonder about that as well. Um, the sort of internal um, hierarchy and where religion would fit within this functionalized context, and also that that continual refrain that seems to be there, that, they, that people want to still maintain distinctiveness, but for the purpose of disabling uh, the state in regards to religion rather than, say, a political ideology and so on. Uh, on, on, on the first uh, uh, point, uh, uh, yes, a political party can discriminate on the basis of the political conviction of a person, and a religious community can discriminate on the basis of the religious conviction of a person. But in the second ca case, we are speaking of a broader area. It's not only the religious conviction. I can discriminate also when I come to the sexual orientation. I can discriminate when I come to, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, private life. Uh, I don't know, I'm thinking of the Catholic Church, abortion. or uh, So my point is uh, both political and religious um, groups can discriminate. But uh, the area of allowed discrimination for religious organizations is broader uh, than the area for political organization, probably because religion is broad, broader than, um, uh, it's not only a political conviction, it's, bro it's not only a belief, it's a, it's a way of life, more intensely than um, a political ideology. That is my explanation. And so there is some justification, but we are on a very delicate um, ground. Uh, regarding the second uh, question, uh, thinking of the US, I think that there is a connection between the two uh, clauses, the non-establishment and the, the, uh, the freedom of religion. Uh, we can't have one without the other. Uh, we can't say uh, we can uh, uh, dispense with the freedom of religion, but uh, we should be careful uh, to, to keep uh, non-establishment. I mean, they go together, in, in my opinion. That would be my answer. Nathan? Well, uh, I have some difficulties, and I believe all of us have the same difficulties. To understand with that my question. With, no, no, come on. <laughs> come on. With the question of the autonomy of uh, religious organizations. And uh, it is a fact that religious organizations are enjoying more autonomy than political or social organizations. It's a fact of life, it is a consequence of historical development, and so on. But should it be that way? And what should be the limits of that? Some people speak about, uh, I believe we know who does it, sphere sovereignty, you see? To what extent is that, should that autonomy be so wide and so absolute? Should it be also exist when it clashes with individual rights? Now, I am not interested in strengthening the intervention of the state in, in the internal life of organizations on the contrary, you know, particularly in some cases. Living in this country, you understand very well that you don't want to, the state to interfere too much. But uh, the question of the limitations of that autonomy is very, very crucial. And particularly when it affects some fundamental rights of individuals 
and the class is so evident, what do you do? Do you permit the religious organizations to keep that uh, autonomy to so wide and so strong, or do you put it, do you put some limitations? And if you put some limitations, who should, who should control that limitation? It's a difficult subject. Maybe also in this case we should speak about an international standard, I don't know. Uh, um, I agree it's a problem. I, 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 uh, for example, think, think of two recent, recent uh, decisions of the US Supreme Court. One is a Hosanna Tabor, the other is a Hobby Lobby. Mm. I think that there is a difference between the two. Uh, Hosanna Tabor, uh, well, I did not like uh, the behavior of that uh, religious group, but apart from this, uh, Hosanna Tabor, uh, in my opinion, is acceptable. Uh, we are speaking of uh, a teacher uh, uh, of uh, a religiously oriented school. Uh, this teacher, in some way, deviated from uh, the official position of that uh, religious group. Uh, she has been fired. Okay, we can discuss this, but there is quite a sound ground for this. On the contrary, I don't think that the Hobby Lobby uh, decision is acceptable, uh, because uh, here uh, we are less close to the core of uh, religion. We are speaking of a commercial activity, not an educational activity. Um, not only uh, we have uh, a different position, the employer and the employees are not on the same uh, level. Uh, in, in that case, in, in the case of Hobby Lobby, the autonomy of uh, the Hobby Lobby company, in my opinion, did not justify uh, that, um, that, uh, that attitude. So one, one criteria, one criterion, to make this distinction, but one among many, I'm not pushing for this only, is how close we are to the core of a religious group. Of? Of a religious group. For example, for the Catholic Church, um, I am in favor of ordination of women personally. But I can understand that we are speaking of something that is very central to the teaching of the Catholic Church in the last 2,000 years. And so I can understand that we are on the ground where there are good justifications for sex discrimination in this case. Uh, a different thing is uh, if we are uh, speaking of, uh, uh, I don't know, if uh, we are speaking of uh, the janitor or, uh, or uh, of, uh, of uh, um, a Catholic, or, or, or the gardener of, of a Catholic school, uh, this is a, 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 different, a different ground. Uh, may I say a second word? Yeah. On the question of Hobby Lobby, I, I disagree. I, 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 I was in favor of the decision of the court, in the room because <laughs> I'll tell you why. And I was attacked by friends uh, showing me uh, an exponent of secular views, and, uh, but I, I'll tell you why. In modern life, the difference between a big enterprise and a big political party are not so, so, so evident. So a big enterprise is something uh, which is, uh, it, it is a public institution virtually. You are, you are, all of us are uh, the, the, the owners of, of a big enterprise because of the, of the economic system. So the difference between a commercial enterprise and, the, and, the, so, and a civil enterprise is not so big. For that reason I believe that it was decent to, to run that, those people to, uh, they have also a conscience despite being a commercial enterprise. So I, 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 I'm not on, so on absolute safe grounds, but uh, I believe it was right. Let's open the conversation and have a round of, of comments and then uh, have a response by the presenters, okay? Mark? 
I don't think this was a banal uh, uh, talk that you gave. I thought it was really important and very, uh, very illuminating, really excellent. Um, now, uh, generally, I agree with you uh, as a descriptive matter that religious organizations are given more space um, than non-religious organizations, and there are hard cases. We don't have to get into the details, but I agree with you descriptively. That's uh, that's that's true, and um, it might be true that um, uh, there's something of a of an equivalence uh, in individual rights outside of organizations that, so to speak, that equality has, uh, has effectively substituted for religious freedom. Maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure. Here's, I guess, the main point I want to uh, make. The, the danger of equality um, is that um, we're talking here about when exceptions have to be made in the law, right? Um, and there can only be a limited number of exceptions before the law collapses. And to the extent that you are driven by an equality notion that, oh, all groups have to be given exceptions if one does, effectively what that will mean is that the state's ability to give out exceptions will be diminished. You hear what I'm saying, right? So I'm not sure whether um, in the individual rights context the, um, the push towards equality is okay. It might be the case that vis-a-vis -vis individuals there's fewer exemptions than we might want being given out. I do think that if trade unions were treated the same way as churches that um, there really would be a problem. There would be too few exemptions that could be given to churches and to the Boy Scouts and to every organization. I think that what we need in order to determine which organizations are exempted and which individuals are exempted ultimately is actually some deep theory, political theory. And I actually think, I've argued in detail actually with regard to um, religious organizations, I think that contractarian Rawlsian thought actually has a lot of purchase here. I won't go through in great detail, but the idea is to you know, think what kind of state would people willingly enter into and you know, allow the state to, you know, to, to potentially regulate them. There's certain hierarchy of commitments they have um, that would say, yeah, I could be a political loser on this issue and still be part of the state, but I would not be willing to be a political loser on this issue. And I think religion is a pretty good tracker of um, you know, where people wouldn't be willing to cede power to the state because religion is just so important to them. I think there's some other conscience-based commitments, but it doesn't extend to all organizations and it doesn't extend even to all commitments that people have. So I think religion does a lot of work, um, even though it's hard to define. So even though Sullivan is right that it's hard to define, we can muddle through because there's real costs um, if we discard the difficult definition the real cost is that the state will not be able to give out as many exemptions as we might think is normatively appropriate. Well, mine's really quick. I mean, you might, we might talk about this later. Why has this become an issue? And you, and you said um, globalization of legal categories has, has put pressure. And I, I just, I, I think you, you sort of raised that point and then left it. I was just fascinated if you wanted to elaborate a little bit more on what exactly that connection is between globalization and, and this becoming a, uh, a universal or legal matter. Yeah. This might follow on that. One, one question I'm having in this larger project on recognition of identity that I'm working on is the question of religion as identity. And it comes from, uh, Robert raised the question about race and religion, and religion being something you choose, whether whereas race is something you're born with. Um, I was really struck by something I read in uh, the book God is Back by the two economist editors, Jim McElthwaite, John McElthwaite and Adrian Woolridge back in 2009, about a proliferation of religious choice. Uh, as a phenomenon in post-secular modernity. Uh, and they describe it as an American model, because we switch all the time, but it's being exported. And it raised the question in my mind about which do we sort of privilege religions that, you ha that we have versus religions that are chosen. 
Uh, and it will come up in my paper because 25% of the women wearing the veil in the France are converts and they have this zeal of converts. From a liberal perspective, I'm, I'm kind of feeling like I'm inclined to give more protection, more credence or something to religions that people choose um, out of a deeply, you know, so, but it, it's this dynamic that I'm, and I'm wondering if that has any connection with uh, Joe Flawley. Can I? Put a question to Nathan following this uh, <laughs> this point because uh, it was uh, it was um, uh, in, in 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 your paper uh, uh, you you say that uh, the nature of the group is not important. Um, uh, what is uh, it's uh, not important when it comes to protection? Yeah, when when uh, when we can to 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 protection. So uh, the next step, uh, as I understood you, is. Uh, Therefore, uh, we do not need uh, a specific protection for uh, religious groups, but we can uh, extend uh, the protection uh, we have uh, for uh, race groups, uh, indigenous uh, groups, uh, to religions. Now, the right to change religion, the point raised by uh, right now, uh, is uh, central to freedom of religion. But it, there is nothing comparable when we come to race or when we come to indigenous group. So my question is, uh, aren't you uh, downplaying <coughs> the specificity of religion when you say that we can protect a religious group groups uh, through the general uh, framework of uh, group uh, protection without the specificity for uh, religion. So that, that was my the question uh, connected to... Is that right? Uh, you want to write to that? If you want. But if you can no, it's very important. <laughs> look, uh, my position is precisely the contrary of that. I don't want to give... I want to give more protection to the religious group. I want to provide the religious group with the same protection that this international society is giving to race, because they, they are giving more protection to race, because they gave a convention against racial discrimination. They didn't give a convention against, race, uh, against uh, discrimination based on religion. So I'm not trying to downplay no. the rights of the religious group. I'm trying to protect it, protect it more. Protect it more better. protection, but uh, less specific protection. That is, uh, as I understood. Mm -hmm. yeah. there, is a, there, is, there is a paradox here. Yeah. There is a paradox here. And the paradox is the following. Take anti-discrimination laws. Anti-discrimination laws came, one of the reasons, to protect religion. As you said, to compare religion to race, to compare religion to uh, gender, etc. So this is the their primary goal. But on the other hand, while you imply anti-discrimination law generally and universally, you come to you come to interfere within religion. That's the point here. So if you take, for example, take the JFK's case that you mentioned. So the idea of anti-discrimination law is to give religious group their autonomy and not to discriminate them. But once you apply it to religious schools saying you are not allowed to discriminate between religious boy and non-religious, and you are not allowed even, you don't have the autonomy to define who is religious, because we, the state, will define for you what is religious. So now you undermine your first goal. So this is the paradox here. So you start with giving, giving religions more protection and the equation between religious group and race group. But on the other hand, if you don't take in, into consideration the specific nature of religion and respect their, uh, uh, their, their autonomy, then you come to the point that you undermine your first goal. <laughs> uh, yes, please. Here we have a problem. If I may, I if I may continue that, that point. Okay. You see, uh, it is true. It is true. But the problem is how far should religious autonomy be accepted? Is it absolute? Don't forget that. Nothing is absolute. Don't, 
Yeah. Don't forget that religious organizations are hierarchical organizations. Not every pope is an Argentinian liberal as Francis. That is very careful. So I don't want the religious group to be absolutely free to decide and even to uh, nullify my individual rights in some cases. But this is very difficult. So it's, a question, it's again a question of balance. But I believe that to provide more protection doesn't mean to eliminate uh, uh, the rights of the group. It means to, to, to add something to, to their rights. Now, autonomy should be also seen in the prospect of an international society which is equilibrated, which wants uh, equal rights for everyone and so on. And uh, hierarchical organizations like the churches, for instance, in particular one, uh, one major church, are creating the problems that uh, we see them every day. It's not a question of firing the gardener. It's a question of uh, interfering also with freedom of conscience of individuals. And you are right that uh, people can live with uh, religious organizations and cannot live with racial group. But the racial group is not imposing upon you some rules of behavior, like is in the case of the religious organization. So it's a very touchy, very difficult situation. Yes, please. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, sorry for my English, sorry for my accent, sorry for my grammar. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to share with you my consideration. First of all, race, race mm -hmm. and the sexual orientation pertain to person. You can't convert to another kind of race, and you can't convert to another kind of sexual orientation. For this reason, to me, sexual orientation and race are completely different from religion. I can't compare the, these two issues. And secondly, uh, what I would say that uh, Francis, uh, my, in my opinion, is only marketing. <laughs> it's not, it's not open-minded as he would like to show. And we can say that if the, the, the struggle in the, the Catholic Church now, Francis, in my opinion, is, also, is a very, very connect, uh, dependent by the uh, Catholic hierarchy uh, in uh, Vatican. So be careful to, uh, to, to think that uh, Francis, Francis uh, at the moment has uh, the, uh, the blackjack in his hand, is my, hmm. my opinion. Thank um, yeah, Just sort of two broader points. One is um, um, all, all this talk about, you know, it bugs me, you know, the state's granting rights, the state's granting exemptions. States granting me uh, who knows what. You know, I mean, this, this gets back to this is a big issue. Um, you know, are we continue coming cap in hand to the state? And um, you know, many religious groups would say, over certain areas, the state has no jurisdiction. In other words, chicken and egg, which comes first? You know, do, 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 do the religion and the divine rights or the religious rights or autonomy? Do, do, do they precede the state? In which case, the state just recognises them, defers to them, and it's like or they, I mean, now this this is this is one of these foundations. So that's just a quick comment. The other one I, I have to say, with all due respect to my learned friend uh, Professor Ferrari, I, I do not accept his core versus peripheral uh, religious practices distinction. Uh, I could refer modestly to chapter 6 of R.R. Lee, Religious Freedom in the Liberal State, second edition, 2000. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, you know, we, we, Ian and I take this issue on because, you know, it's, 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 it comes from Bruce Bagney, you know, there's lots of others, but, you know, if, if, if you have this idea that, that there are certain core religious activities, rites, rituals, and as we move concentrically outward from them, the, the religious protection diminishes accordingly. Well, you're, you're into very slippery, almost theological analysis there. Who decides, again, which, which is a core uh, function, practice, belief, etc. You know, oh, um, now, you could defer to the religious organisation, but they don't want to do that. So it comes back to the secular tribunal court to decide, well, you know, the right to smack kids for the punishment. There's a very peripheral sort of religious belief, whereas, you know, praying, etc., etc. Et and, and this, to me, to be a bit harsh on you, se seems to reflect, a, I'm a Catholic now myself, but you know, a, a, a very dualistic Catholic way of thinking about life. 
in the secular and the sacred, in the lay, and <laughs> probably no, no, yes, no, 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 the <laughs> and, and, and the clay, and, and the clerical, and the lay. Whereas if, if, if you'd been a good neo Calvinist, as I was at one stage, I'd be here. It's not true. But um, <laughs> is, is, is that, you know, all, all of life is, is lived, it has a directional quality to it. It's lived either in obedience to or disobedience. But there are no secular and sacred spheres at all. So to teach at a school is no different than selling arts and crafts, really. Mm -hmm. you know, they're all going to the glory. But one is ostensibly closer to religious function, but only ostensibly, really. Um, yeah, and, and that, that, that's another, that's just another sort of general observation that pervades this whole discussion. Okay, I would like to add uh, two questions. One is, uh, to Professor Lerner, is can you see the shift that Professor Ferrari uh, took, took from Gedex in the international instruments? So can we take, it's a, I think a good test for the, for the theory, do we see that as the, that the new documents are more equality based than liberty based if we go back to the classical uh, first generation of uh, declarations of human rights and protection of the population? So that's a question, I'm not sure, open. Uh, if you have anything to say about that. And second, I would like to uh, hop on to what Rex said. Uh, in the 20s in Israel, the rabbis said that voting rights for women is an issue of life and death. You should die and not let women vote or be elected. And then the uh, polity in Israel decided that women would have voting rights and therefore the Orthodox community stood before a decision to lose 50% of its political power and suddenly women vote. So they still not get elected because they can get away with that because the system lets them get away with that. But when the incentives are big enough, and I think Pope Francis said very candidly, ordination of women is not core uh, Catholic belief. I won't change it. But he said, uh, but, but he, uh, he said it. It could be changed. It is a papal decision. Because uh, he believes in change. What? He believes in change, Francisco. Yeah, it's or at least. And, and, and I think, but it is their autonomy to decide that. Exactly. And I think that's. Not, it's not the state to decide whether it's poor right. or peripheral. But the it but is for the church to decide. But the whether question it's is what, what time frame you take. And I think that one little comment you made uh, before is something that started me thinking. Is race so unescapable if we talk about. 3,000 years, colors of skin. Is uh, sexual orientation over three generations uh, in one family who is has what sexual orientation in and out of faith and what the division is, law decides here and now. But when we decide about what is core and what is the definition of group and what is the definition of belief, we're talking about other time frames which in law we're not used to think about. And I think this is a very interesting comment which made me think. But let's, I'm sorry. So let's, uh, let's try to define, redefine how the conference was planned. We're trying to have these discussions and then we have half hours breaks between the sessions to go on but with coffee in hand. So let's let the panelists have a right of, you know, like response and enriching us, and then we'll go on. No offense. Okay. Yes, please. Well, uh, in reply to your question, sir, one quick question. International legislation is going through a period of stagnation. There are not very many new treaties. So I cannot reply to your question. The, the question of the shift in favor of equality is probably more a European development than an international development. I'm not sure about it, but this is my feeling. Now, on the international arena, there is stagnation. There are not very few, very many new uh, treaties. I believe that it would be safe to undertake a fight 
to have adopted a, a convention on, on religious rights because this can be made. Mm -hmm. it, we agree, there is agreement between may, liberal states and uh, liberal organizations. This can be done. But ex except for that, I don't see any real uh, progress. Uh, well, I, I'm afraid I forgot many of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just just what, what I remember. So, uh, so uh, one question was about uh, uh, globalization, if I, if I remember well. Uh, I think that, uh, um, for example, thinking of uh, Sullivan's book, yeah, um, I tend to interpret it uh, as uh, a byproduct of uh, uh, globalization. In the sense, Sullivan says, uh, we cannot rely on freedom of religion because we see that uh, uh, tribunals uh, um, tend to have their own notion of religion and impose it on, uh, on, on the cases uh, they have to judge. So we should uh, dispose of freedom of religion and replace freedom of religion with freedom of speech, freedom of association, non-discrimination, etc. Uh, maybe I am wrong, I never uh, studied this in depth. But these rights, freedom of association, freedom of speech, in my opinion, have a more relevant functional profile than rights like freedom of religion, freedom of art, that kind of freedoms, which are connected more directly to a content. And in this sense, it seems to me that uh, um, we are, uh, in a way, we think we are unable to manage religious diversity through freedom of religion. Because freedom of religion is uh, connected to a specific notion of religion. So the, the attempt is we shall try to manage uh, religious diversity through freedom of association, freedom of speech, non-discrimination to different rights. So we don't have to take a position, is this a religion or not? We can uh, leave this problem aside. So what do you do with autonomy? No, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's more broad in my opinion. Uh, the consequence of this, of a Sullivan approach, is, uh, in my opinion, uh, very negative regarding uh, autonomy. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if we, uh, uh, there was a case in the US, I think it was the Martinez case, um, uh, the, the University Association um, uh, that, uh, that uh, was uh, um, uh, expelled from the campus or something like that because uh, it did not accept, uh, was it homosexual relations, uh, if I remember well. Uh, now, in, in that case, if the only defense uh, is the freedom of religion, you can uh, defend that association on the ground of freedom of association or, or uh, on different grounds. If we um, get rid of freedom of religion, there is an area of rights that cannot be defended anymore. That is uh, what uh, my, my criticism to uh, Sullivan uh, uh, position. It's not the same thing. Um, if we are without the right to freedom of religion, we cannot say, okay, never mind, we have a freedom of association, a freedom of speech. The end result is the same. No, it's not true in my opinion. This is um, um, my, um, my point on, on, on this. Um, and that's all I remember. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.